on, church. Now go with me to Exodus, the ninth chapter. Let's look at something again, verses 22. Stay with me, church. Hallelujah. And the Lord said unto Moses, this is again another, another plague, stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, and there may be hail in all the land of Egypt upon man and upon beasts and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out. Say, he stretched out. He stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground. Ooh, Jesus, how can you have hail and fire at the same time? And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, it, very grievous, such as there was none like in Egypt and all the land of Egypt since it became a nation and the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt all that was in the field both man and beast and the hail smote every herb field break broke every tree of the field only in the land altogether of Goshen where the children of Israel were where there was no hail now another study Goshen was not touched now by hail and fire. Go with me to Exodus 10 chapter now. Verses 21. Now notice uh, the homework's done, church. All you got to do is just pull, it, pull the promises out. Come on, church. Homework's done. All you got to do is just pull the promises out. And in verses 21 of chapter 10, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. How many people know what darkness is? can be felt. It's awful. Darkness can be felt. I know I was lost in the in a desert without light, without flashlight, without gas, anything. And I felt darkness. Darkness has demons. If you're not careful, you can get into that kind of darkness and you realize that you have to stand strong against that, right? Notice what it says here. And the Lord said unto, and in verse 22, and Moses stretched forth his hands toward heaven and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt there, three days. Ooh, three days. Wow. And they saw not one another, neither rose any man from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. Say with me, Amen. Amen. So in other words, Goshen had light. Goshen had light. So the children of Israel had light for three days. Now I want to tell you something. They didn't have electric, uh, elect, elect, electric grid, so that meant their candles and their oil was not working. Candles and oil was not working for Egypt to be without light for those three days because he says they walked in darkness. They could not see each other. So you can imagine the, 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 the fear, the, the activity of, of demonic activity taking place. They couldn't even light matches or anything. They couldn't. It was so dark. The Bible calls it thick darkness. I want you to think about it. Thick darkness is pretty bad. It is pretty bad when you can't see nothing. Hallelujah. Amen. Now notice this. But we have to see something. This is our promise. Like I said, it's already accomplished. Homework's done. All we got to do is pull from this and believe God that we have boundaries. But the devil knows how to take this promise from the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the body of Christ. The devil knows how to put people in darkness, put people in problems and say, well, you know what? The same thing's happened to me. No, 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 no. You're people of God. You're people that are living in Goshen by the blood of Jesus. And what happens to the world does not happen to the body. What happens outside doesn't happen to us inside. Come on, church. We got to stand on that word. Come on, church. Amen. So in other words, the church has to establish Goshen. And I believe, this is what the Holy Spirit is saying, I believe that we have to establish Goshen in our families, in our jobs, first of all, in our church families, jobs, in our belongings, in our land, in our property, in everything that we owe. We got to establish Goshen. We can't allow the enemy to take anything from us. And if the devil steals, we have to put a demand immediately and command seven for return and command the blessing to be on what was taken to me, uh, from me. You see what I'm saying? So we have to do this. It doesn't matter if it's job, property, people, family, whatever it may be. You have the right of Goshen believers, people that have been bought by the blood of Jesus, to stand on that. So we have to establish Goshen. Now notice this. How do you establish Goshen? You use the word of God. You make a demand. Now I want to ask you something. Would, would you allow a thief to come into your house and knock on the door, maybe ring the doorbell and say, hello, I'm a thief. I'm here to steal your children. That, I think he will not say another word after children. His teeth are down his throat, right? And he's out the door quick, right? Now, 
Why do we allow the devil that we can't see physically to take something that we see physically? Come on, church. Why do we allow that? Well, I don't allow it. It just happens. No, no, no. I believe we have to establish Goshen more than ever because the devil's out there. He knows his time is short, so he's trying to do everything he can not to attack the world, but the world's already in darkness, so he has his sights on the body. He has his sights on the body of Christ, and he tries to cause him to ignore the history that's the pro that are in the Word of God, which are the promises of God. Are you listening, church? The promises of God. The promises. Say with me the promises of God. Now let's look at something. Go with me to Ephesians. I want you tonight to start operating as a mighty warrior in the yes. kingdom of God. Yes. Yes. You demand yes. that your surrounding turns into Goshen. You demand that your surrounding in your life be turned into Goshen, right? Come on, church. Ephesians, the, the, uh, let's look at something. Go with me to Ephesians, the first chapter. Let's look at verses, verses 16. Now notice what it says. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So what is Paul talking about right here? He's talking about prayers. Say with me, prayers. prayers. Now I'm going to ask you, I'm going I'm to tell you something. I'm going to encourage you. There are many ways to pray. But there was one way you need to pray over, uh, how to pray over your stuff, family and things. There's many ways to pray. But you have to understand something. You have to recognize when the devil starts to messing, and like the way Bo says it, God starts to what? Bless. When the devil, well, Shambok, but then Bo. Shambok's gone to heaven, so I give Bo the praise now, the glory for that. Uh, uh, listen to this. That's what here. When the devil starts to mess, God starts to bless. You got to have that in your heart. Say it with me. When the devil starts to mess, God starts to bless. You got to turn it into a blessing immediately. Now, notice what it says. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So he's talking about prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That's the prayer. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling. You got a calling, ladies and gentlemen, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. In other words, you are saints, you have an inheritance. And what is the exceeding greatness of this power, of his power, that's the power of Jesus, toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at the right hand of the hand in the heavenly throne, uh, in the heavenly places, far above, say with me, far above. All principality, that's included every demon, over every power, that's including the power of every demon and, and devil and Satan, over every might and over every dominion, that means where the enemy rules and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet. Listen, everything has been put under Jesus' feet. Now look at it again. All things have been put under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. That's you and me. He has been given to us. He is the head of the church. He has authority, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in things. Now notice this. There's something about this type of prayer Paul is saying. Paul is saying, you have so much given to you. I pray, first of all, that your eyes will be unopened. I pray that your eyes will be open, that you'll have revelation, that you'll know what is your hope, what is the promise given to you. So in other words, we need to pray this prayer, ladies and gentlemen, over our lives. We need to pray this. Come on, church. Now look at this. Look at this in chapter 2. Go with me to chapter 2. Glory. Glory to God. Chapter 2, verses 1. And you... He's talking to me. Say, me. me. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So in other words, look at that word, quickened. You, which Jesus has quickened. Listen, quickening is powerful. He's quickened you. What did he quicken you with? He's caused you. He quickened you. Look at verses 2. Where in the time past you walked according to the course of this world. You were once people of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. See, you were once like this. Go all the way down to verses 7 now. Excuse me, verses, verses 4. But God... 
who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us, this is it, quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. Where are you seated right now according to the word of God? In heavenly places. In heavenly places. Look at it again. Look at it again. Look at it again. Verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Positionally speaking, ladies and gentlemen, this is our rightful place. Let me ask you a question, which I asked a couple of weeks ago. A king, when he takes his authority, does he have authority standing or sitting? Sitting. So in other words, this is where you sit next to Jesus. Now notice this, notice this. Let's watch it for a moment. But wait a minute, you say, but a king, I'm not a king. No, 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 no. According to the word of God, he's made us kings. And secondly, he's made us what? Priest. Come on, church, help me out. Unto his Lord. So we're kings and priests unto the Lord. So in other words, we have the rightful authority. We're seated in heavenly places with Jesus. Now, therefore, we have the authority to speak his word, demand and command. Come on, church. We have this. Now, notice this. Notice this. Look at verses. I want you to look at verses, uh, chapter 1 of verses 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him, Jesus, at his right hand in the heavenly places. So in other words, you're seated in the heavenly places with Jesus. If you go back to chapter 2, look at chapter 2, verses 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places with Christ. So you're sharing with Jesus the same position that Jesus is in right now. Come on, church. According to this word, you're seated with him positionally. Well, Pastor, I'm here in Oklahoma City. Your body's here in Oklahoma City, but positionally speaking, you have the right to call the Word of God in authority because you're seated in heavenly places. Come on, church. Can you say amen? amen? So in other words, look what it says. I want you to see something. Go with me to quickly. Go with me to Colossians now. Hold your finger there. We're going to come back and put just put a marker there. Come on, church. Colossians, the first chapter. Hallelujah. Amen. Notice what it says here in verse 12. The first chapter, verses 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us, that word meet, is able. Giving thanks to the Father, which has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That's you. Here it is. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. You're no longer under the power of darkness. And has translated us. Look at that word translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of him, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So look at that word translated. That word translated, if you look up that word translated, it means you're, you were carried from one place to another. I've been translated, ladies and gentlemen. I'm translated. Where were you translated? I'm translated to the side of Jesus Christ where Jesus is at. Spiritually speaking, I'm translated there. But I see your body. No, 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 no. You're seeing my body, but the thing that I'm talking about is spiritual position. Now, let me give you, let me give you a good example about spiritual position. Here we have a little lady that's probably 105 pounds, and she's a police officer. And she go. do you drive a semi-truck? Or just okay, and she uh, she gets she uh, happens to be on the corner, and uh, and Michael is is kind of speeding through through this little town, and she happens to see him speeding, so she so she steps out and she tells Michael to stop. Michael has two things to do: put his foot on the brake, or just keep going. But consequences are you listening to? Us? Consequences happen here. What is he doing? He has to stop. Why does Michael stop? Because of the 105-pound lady or because of what she represents? Right? Both. But the thing that she has is the authority that she carries. So in other words, the person who has the authority, uh, has the authority to stop the truck is the person that carries out the authority. Now I want you to think about it. Jesus has been given the authority. 
He took the keys of death and hell from Satan. He's been placed at the right hand of the Father. Now he's been given the authority. Now you're represented on earth. Now you have the authority here on earth. Come on, church, can you say amen? Come on, church, you have the authority. Now notice this. I want to say something. You've got to believe this. If you ever want to have authority, you've got to believe this. Right now, tell your neighbor, or no, I'll tell you what, close your eyes right now and say, I believe. I believe. Satan, I believe. Satan, I, believe. I, rebuke I rebuke you. You go, you go. In, Jesus in Jesus' name. I believe. I know this is why did I say that? Because see, Satan likes to confuse the body and say, no, that can't be so. It is so when you recognize the authority you have. It is so, and this is the way you have to use this authority. Now go with me to 1 Peter. The reason why I say that is because the body of Christ somehow, and I'm talking about the body of Christ. I, I'm not talking about the unbeliever. The unbeliever still has to get saved and still have to be washed by the blood to have this authority. But I'm talking about to the body, the, the born-again believers in this room and those that are watching. Born-again believers, you have to realize that the Bible is true not only in finances, where people get excited, but it also is true on your authority, where people don't understand. People get un to understand, yeah, God wants to be rich, woohoo, money coming, yeah, they get excited and they operate in faith, but when they get into the authority part, they just have a hard time believing. The same faith that it took you to receive Jesus is the same faith that you're going to need to believe this. Come on, church, amen? Because, see, this is where it's at. Look what it says in 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 5. Listen to this. 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 5. You also, you also, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. Can you say amen? amen. You're built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, uh, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God, by Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Now I want you to look at, look at verses 9 now. But you, but you, but you, but you, say with me, but me. But you are a chosen generation. Oh Jesus, I love that. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you show forth the praises of him who has called you. Demilo! Andrew! Called you, called you, called you yes. out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes. And it is, I remember, I remember I was raised in a household of Christians. And yet when, when, when I was a teenager, I just want to do my own things. And I remember one time, and this is sad really, but I have to tell you this. One time we skipped school and we're all drinking all day long. Uh, we're drinking. And there must have been about 15 people in this house. We're having a party during the day, and all of a sudden, uh, the doors knocked hard, and we saw policemen outside, right? And all I remember was the door being kicked open, and I remember I ran, grabbed my friend Patrick by the hair. Something, something happened that, that I got so much energy that I jumped through a window, grabbed his hair, he had long hair to the back, grabbed his hair, and he ran, and we ran, it must have been five miles, we ran from that house all the way to a park where we hid the rest of the day. And so the, um, the, the, the helicopters were there, they arrested all my friends, and me and Patrick never got arrested. Isn't that sad? Thank you, Jesus, right? But I was a sinner. But I remember when I was sitting in that park, I was saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Notice this. Just, I just was committing sin. And I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I remember such a peace came over my heart when I was sitting on. And that's why when I go to, whenever I go to Houston, I go to that park. Because I remember that same picnic table that is still there. I remember sitting there and thanking Jesus. Lord, forgive me. I will never do this. Thank you for delivering me. I could have been arrested. I didn't even know at that time they were arrested. But I knew that everybody's bust, being busted down and everything. Cops everywhere. In fact, a couple of cops were chasing us. They couldn't catch us. That's how fast we we're running. But the thing I want to tell you, what I want to say about this is this, is this, is that when I remember there, I felt God, even though I had messed up, I felt God. And I promised to God that I'll never do it. I never went back to that house again. Never did do that again. Now, what I want to tell you, the power of God was present to pull me from that darkness and to open my understanding that it was him and to bring me into the kingdom of God. Now, notice this. I'm a pastor now. Isn't that amazing? 
Pastor, now, how is that possible? He pulled me out of darkness, brought me into that marvelous light. He called me that day on that picnic table. I received him, and I haven't stopped. I haven't since looked back since. You see what I'm saying? See the power of God? So therefore, I'm a king, and I'm a priest before God. I remember those days. I remember those days. There are so many bad things I could tell you, and I don't think I'll ever tell you unless the Lord tells me. But there's so many things, right? But you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that, sh that, show, that should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So in other words, you are that person. So in other words, you're no yes. different than me. You're no different than me. Can you say hallelujah? You're no different than me. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So in other words, you have to remind the devil. Listen to this. You've got to remind the devil that we've been translated out of darkness. You've got to tell the devil every time you feel the attack, whenever the devil comes and says, you're nobody, you can never do it. You have to tell the devil, devil, I want you to remember, I've been translated out of darkness into the marvelous light. I used to be in your darkness, but I'm in the light now. You've got to remember it and remind the devil. Tell the devil every day of your life when the devil attacks your mind. Your, your, your mental fa faculties, your body. Sometimes you may think, well, I'm just ugly. you got to tell the devil, devil, I'm royal before Jesus. I'm yes, royal. Because yes, see, the right. battle is in the mind, right. not in the spirit. Right. It's in the mind. So think about it. The spirit is alive to Jesus, but the mind is where you have to overcome it. And this is where the devil works. I know, I know what I'm talking about, folks, because the devil even attacks me in the mind mostly every day. I got to take authority. I say, no, Father, I rebuke that thought in Jesus' name. I take authority, and you have to remind the devil. Remind the devil that you are translated out of darkness into light. Remind the devil. Now, notice this. Not only do you remind the devil, but you got to remind yourself after you remind the devil that I'm somebody. I have authority. Say with me, I'm somebody, and I have authority. I'm somebody. I want you to say with me, I have been seated in heavenly places by Jesus Christ. Say this with me. Devil, you're a liar. I'm seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to say this. Now, I command you in the name of Jesus. Go now in Jesus' name. See, that's the authority. See, the devil... Especially now, he's picking more, he's bombarding the mind more, he's accusation, doing accusa accusational causes, thievery, whatever's happened. I'm telling you folks, this is a time to come alive even greater with your authority. Come on, church, can you say amen? So in other words, you have to establish this. You have to establish this. I want you to see something. Go with me to Romans now. Romans. Romans, the, the, the fifth chapter. And uh, look at Romans, the fifth chapter, in verses... 17. Notice what Paul told the church at Rome, which now we read and we understand. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. That's, that's talking about Adam. For by one man's offense, which is Adam, death reigned by him. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now notice this. If Adam sinned, when Adam sinned, death came to all. Jesus came on the scene, on the scene like Pastor Abel talked about the new covenant through his death, burial, and resurrection, which is blood. So in other words, now his resurrection gave us life. Now that's covenant talk. That's covenant talk. So in other words, if I have life, then death doesn't rule in me. Now notice, what does death have? Death has altogether fear. Fear is faith contaminated. Whenever you have fear, remember I talked about we don't fear demons, we don't fear man, and we don't fear beast. I'm telling, uh, let's add we don't fear anything. Now notice this, why do I say that? Because see, fear is the open door that causes faith to be contaminated. Whenever there is a, a weakness, weakness of faith in me, then I've got to rebuke fear. Whenever there's a weakness of, of mistrust, then I've got to rebuke fear. Whenever there's anger in me, I've got to rebuke fear. Do you notice that anger has fear? You saw, notice that? Whenever you have mistrust of something, you think, well, I don't trust that person. That's fear. So notice this. You've got to immediately work on that. So in other words, fear is the culprit here. Fear. Fear bringeth death. Death, Jesus overcame it. So you can't mingle in death and you say, well, I don't have fear. Well, if you mingle in death, you have fear. If you have fear, you're mingling in death. So in other words, we have to immediately recognize that Jesus did it for us. Now go back to Ephesians now. I want you, I want you to take this personally. I want you to 
make this scripture personally. Let's read from 1 Ephesians 17 all the way to 23. And then we're going to go to chapter 2. We're going to read 1 and 2. And then we're going to, we're going to jump down to verses 5 and 6. Okay? Now I want you to put your name in there. Now, now hear, hear me say verses 17 and then, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Right? That the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto me. You see that word you? He's talking about, and I'm going to put me in there. Are you ready? Are you ready, church? Let's make it personal. Verses 17. All together, read, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, that I may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glorious of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceedingly greatness of his power toward me, who believe according to the working of his power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now, verse 21, you got to say far above. Far above. I want you to say it again. Far above. You have to recognize that. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named not only in this world, but also that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body. And I'm part of the body. You're part of the body, which is the body, the fullness of that filleth in all. Now let's go to chapter 2, verses 1. And then we're going to jump down to verses um, 5 and or verses five and 6. Let's read. All right. And me, and me, say it with me, and me hath he quickened who was dead in transgressions and sin. Verse 2. Wherein in times past I walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Now go all the way down to verses 5 or verses 4. Even when I was dead in sin, hath quickened me together with Christ by grace, I am saved. Verses, verses 6, and hath raised me. Come on, church, say it again. And has raised me up together and made me sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Now notice this. This is our authority. This is the prayer that Paul was telling the church to set up your boundaries. Set up your boundaries. And listen, church, um, we went to a pastor's, uh, uh, an authority conference a couple weeks ago, and, and we invited you to go, and some of you didn't go, or uh, some of you did, uh, you know. But anyway, the thing about this is this. Where you learn the word, you have to activate it. Christine and I started doing this every morning. That means we have to make time to get this scripture and sit down and we say it. Since we've been saying it, there has been some, some visual, visual things that we can penetrate into the spirit realm. We're seeing things now that we can fight at. Before it was just, well, we don't know this. We don't know the way. I don't know. Now we know. We go into it. Now that's certain circumstances, which we have the victory by faith. Now notice this. That means, church, if we're going to set up a Goshen, I'm telling you, I'm setting up a Goshen around my family. I'm not letting the devil. I'm not going to let the devil use people or things to separate, sever, or destroy my family. So we're in warfare. Christian and I are in warfare. Now notice this, that means my, the church the same, our church, the church. We're not going to let the enemy uh, steal, use people, use anything to destroy the works of God. So what does that mean? That means I have to go into some warfare. Now that means I have to build a Goshen. I have to put a bloodline, say with me bloodline. A bloodline is like a blood wall. You set it around your home. Uh, every day when we leave our house, we've been doing that for years and years. When we leave our house, I'll say, Father, I thank you for your angels that protect my home. Uh, I, I rebuke any strongholds of the devil. Uh, I speak safety to my pets. Father, I thank you for the anointing that's here that no one will come around my neighbor or around my house. I do that every day. I do that, I do that every day. We, we pray over things. And, and I've learned something that when you set up a bloodline like that, I'm talking about when, with this authority. When you set up a bloodline with this authority, then the devil is not coming against you. He's coming against the angels of God and Jesus himself. 
That means you have the victory. We have to do this. We have to do this over our money, over our family, over our businesses, over our homes, over our wives, our children, our pets. We got to do this. And I'm telling you, this is where revelation has to increase. Notice what it says in, in chapter 1 again. Notice what it says that the verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of our Lord Jesus, the, the Father of glory may give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We need wisdom how to pray. We need revelation in the knowledge of him. We need to know just that we need to move up now. We need to move up now. We have to graduate church. Come on. Yeah. Uh, we've been in boot camp too long. We got to get out and go into the front lines now. It's time to get up and say, uh-uh, uh-uh. We're not going to let the devil take anything any longer. We're not going to let the devil uh, hurt us. Come on, church. When I prayed for this, this, this lady today about her daughter, you know, great tears came on her. And I, saw, I felt like Jesus would, the compassion on her. Yeah, it's her child. I don't even know her. But I felt the compassion. Big old, you should have seen tears. For, you know, her baby, four years old, wondering that she has heart disease. And so you got to understand something. Man, when, when I've been reading this, this word and knowing who I am, man, I know. I come up and I laid hands on her. I says, I want you to go home. You lay hands on your daughter and you command her to be healed in Jesus' name. And she looked at me and I says, I said, yeah, do it, do it, do it, do it. So we prayed for her, and I'm telling you, the anointing was released. Now, we can't wait for a good report. Come on, church. I'm telling you, we have to stand against the enemies in these days. As it gets darker out there, the body of Christ gets brighter. And don't put yourself in Egypt any longer. You've been put out of Egypt. Jesus set you free. We're now in Goshen by the blood of Jesus. Come on, church. Can you say amen? We're not in Goshen now. We're now in Goshen. Come on, church. I know that sounds strange. But listen, say with me, I'm in Goshen. I'm in Goshen. I'm protected by the blood of Jesus. I'm protected. Amen. Come on, church. Can, can you say amen? See, we don't realize how much the Lord has protected us all day long. We don't know. Only if we knew how many times the angels have been there for us all day long. See, so we have to get a hold of this word of God. Amen. Come on, church. Let's go ahead and stand up. Amen.